So again, good evening. Um, my name is Corky, and I'm with Yolo Basin Foundation, and I'm very excited uh, to be the host this evening for our program, our Flyway Nights. Flyway Nights is a speaker series that we host during the um, six months of the year, basically the cooler months, shall we say, the more wintry kind of months. Um, this evening, we're going to be hearing from Joe Hobbs, our Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area Manager. But I also wanted to remind you that last month, we had a speaker about the Sacramento Valley Red Fox, and that is now on our YouTube channel. And next month, we're going to be hearing about the common mirror in, um, on Devil's Slide Rock. Uh, in San Francisco Bay, and the recovery um, that has taken place there and the work that went into making that happen. So um, our website is yolobasin.org, and that is where you can find more information. I am going to turn over tonight's program um, to Joe Hobbs, the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area Manager. Thanks so much, Joe, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Corky. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually at home, but not at the Yolo Basin Foundation. Um, just first things first, if I cut out and my uh, internet drops, I will try to log back in. I had a couple issues earlier today, so hopefully that does not happen. Um, like Corky said, my name is Joe Hobbs. I'm the Area Manager I've been at YOLO for almost three years, just under uh, one more month to go and I make it a total of three years. I've been with the department for 21 years as a permanent employee. Uh, prior to becoming the area manager, I was the statewide elk and antelope coordinator. Uh, prior to that, I worked in the wetland program. I worked in timber harvest, worked in the private lands management. Um, prior to working for the department, I worked for Ducks Unlimited down in the grass sands in Los Banos for three years. I also, uh, through college, um, worked for the department as a scientific aide. I uh, worked with them for my master's degrees following Thule white-fronted geese around the Sacramento Valley with radio telemetry. Um, so again, I've had a you know, vast experience with the department and some outside department, a majority of that in wetlands and uh, game management. So I'll give you a start the presentation and see, hopefully don't have any technical difficulties. So the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area is in what the department calls our Region 3. It's our Bay Delta region. There are seven total regions within the department. So there are other wildlife areas in Region 3. Um, Yolo is the largest, uh, and it's also one of the two staffed wildlife areas. Grizzly Island Wildlife Area is the other staffed wildlife area. Uh, so the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area is part of the Yolo Basin, which is a natural basin on the north edge of the delta. Um, the whole basin in its in totality is about 80,000 acres. Uh, Yolo is just under 17,000 acres. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of story for how the, the wildlife area came into existence, but it officially opened in 1997. Uh, we opened to the public with about 3,700 acres of habitat. Um, in about 2001, the Wildlife Conservation Board, <coughs> excuse me, purchased about 12,000 additional acres with several other ranches and acquisitions. So that total, the total acres for the wildlife area is again, just under 17,000 acres, about 22 square miles. Um, this is all accomplished by about 2005. <coughs> One interesting note is the staffing level at the wildlife area when it was 3,700 acres is just pretty much exactly the same as it is now at just under 17,000 acres and most of the same equipment when it was started you know back in the 90s. So I'll give a quick overview of the wildlife area. Um, in general we're open sunrise to sunset every day of the year except for Christmas. This means one of the staff members must open and close the gate on top of the levee um, every day. There is a five mile auditor for viewing uh, wildlife and there are some short hiking trails. You know, on the audit tour, there are no bikes, horses, or dogs, um, unless they're in your vehicle with you. I've yet to see a horse in a vehicle, but I have seen people riding horses on the wildlife area, and unfortunately had to ask them um, if they could, you know, cease that activity. 
Um, we also are open to hunting. Uh, our main hunting is waterfowl, pheasant, followed by dove and fishing. The next major activity is wildlife viewing and nature study. Um, again, in general, um, each year there's about 4,000 students and 8,000 hunters that visit the wildlife area. We really don't have a great number on the number of uh, nature viewers or bird watchers that, that happen because there's really not a great way to count them, but we're working with the Yolo Basin Foundation to come up with a better estimate. Um, this year, obviously, with the whole COVID requirements, the student, number of students was greatly reduced. Again, open to hunting and fishing, and obviously the rooster fish is a joke, does not happen on the wildlife area. The main fish that people catch on the wildlife area are carp, striper, catfish, and, and the crappie. So again, one of the other popular activities is wildlife viewing and nature study. So the Yolo Basin Foundation is responsible for the education and outreach in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. They're the nonprofit that's associated with the wildlife area and they're on site and they run the, the student uh, groups. And so here's an example of the volunteers of the Yolo Basin Foundation teaching students about wetlands and wildlife. Uh, so they also run the discovery of the flyway. And since 1997, there's been over 70,000 students that came through their programs from schools all over um, the greater Valley area. Another thing that's interesting at the wildlife area is the bat walks, walk and talks. Uh, actually, Corky leads these. It's one of the most popular activities that we have on the wildlife area. It's run from July through September each year, given about 50 tours total with over 3,000 people attending. Um, this year, obviously, that was greatly reduced with the COVID restrictions. We finally were able to implement some uh, bat tours towards the later part of the summer, but not to the extent that it has been in the past. And I'm hoping that all gets squared away so we can actually have those tours this summer because they're very, very popular. It's a quick picture of the bats in the cracks of the freeway. You know, one of the things that's unique about YOLO is um, we have wildlife friendly agriculture. So I have, and I'll go over a little bit later, but I have grazing and rice production. The value of those leases combined is over $700,000 per year. Um, so again, there's two grazing leases and one rice lease. So that money or um, the, the lease activities in a large part are managed by the YOLO Resource Conservation District. They do a lot of the day-to-day -day activities, um, budgeting, you know, working with the leases um, for all the requirements that are part of the lease. Uh, so that money that I get from those leases is a huge portion of um, my budget to fund the operation and maintenance of the wildlife area. That money all rolled into um, a grant through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's a Pittman-Robertson Act. So that is a excise tax on sporting arms and ammunition. So the state matches money and then the federal government through the PR fund uh, matches that money three to one. So there's about 2,000 acres of rice um, through a lease on the wildlife area. And a part of that part of that rice lease, they're required to flood shorebird use each summer. So these fields rotate around from year to year, um, but they put water on one field in July for about 30 days, and then water on another field in August uh, for about 30 days. Uh, this year was a little bit different. Um, we had a lot of construction activities and trying to find fields that weren't going to interfere um, with the work that we're doing. So we didn't actually you know, limit their water supply or put water next to somewhere um, that we didn't want later on in the year. So, you know, rice is a, a pretty wildlife friendly crop. It's used, you know, there's summer water out there. Um, it's used by wildlife all during the summer, you know, and all during the winter as well. Uh, this is an example of them harvesting uh, white rice. There's basically two types of rice that are grown on the wildlife area. Uh, wild, or white rice and wild rice. So here it is uh, harvesting white rice. You can see after the harvester gets up through the field, they'll put them in trailers. And this is an example, a you know, picture of, of wild rice, which is a shorter growing season crop for wild rice. It's about 90 days. So it's pretty suited to the causeway or the bypass. Um, it's used, it does better in the cooler evening temperatures that we tend to have from our Delta breezes. Um, also due to potential flooding events, sometimes they can't get in as early as they can outside the bypass to plant rice. So there's shorter season uh, crop 
really well and they can get it in on areas where we have enough time to grow white rice, which takes about 120 days, um, depending on the exact variety. So the difference in the harvest of wild rice is it's harvested while the fields are still flooded. So they leave you know, water in the fields and use a mechanical harvester to, hunt, to harvest it while um, you know, the crop is still inundated. And you can see you know, instantly after the harvester goes by, the wildlife come in, um, take advantage of the area that was mowed down and catch little critters. Um, here you have a bunch of egrets and ibis feeding right behind the harvester. And then after um, the rice is harvested, both the white and the wild, the department goes through and floods those fields for wintering migratory waterfowl. It also aids in straw decomposition from the rice straw for the farmer. And so you see the results in the end, you know, it's, it's a benefit by wildlife utilizing those flooded fields, um, farmer producing food, you know, and jobs uh, all within the Sacramento Valley. So on my grazing right now, it's just cattle. So uh, there's about 5,000 acres, a little over in grazing. That's both irrigated and dry land pasture. One thing that's unique, um, so the irrigated pasture actually puts water out on those fields for short periods of time in the summer. Again, water in the summer in the valley is a pretty limiting um, factor. So that actually benefits a lot of the wildlife that use, um, use those fields. What you also see is those graze fields, late winter, early spring, the migratory uh, geese that are coming back, going north to the breeding grounds, will stop in and in huge flocks, usually for you know, different periods of time, um, hit those graze fields because the grass is all short and it's newly growing and it's highly nutritious. Uh, the other benefit of cattle, unfortunately, in the wildlife area is it helps keep our vernal pool habitats open and free of non-native species um, that would outcompete them normally if it was not grazed. So the grazing helps benefit um, the native plants. You know, one of the things, again, I've been working on this and I, and I saw my list of things to get done is we're updating the hiking trail. Um, it's still a work in progress. So we need to finalize that and get the signs out um, so people can find them a lot more easier. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, again, the, this wildlife area is unique in that it is first and foremost a flood control. Um, this takes water around Sacramento to reduce the potential for flooding of Sacramento, puts it through the bypass, you know, dumps it on the wildlife area, then out into the delta. So it has that. We have working agriculture, you know, both rice and cattle. We have wildlife habitat and lots of public use. You know, it's a, it's a big wildlife area right outside of Sacramento, not that far from San Francisco. It's got a high visitation rate and lots of public use on the wildlife area. Um, so wetland management on the wildlife area basically boils down to water management. Um, so we get our waters from low lift pumps from the tow drain um, and then put it basically into high line ditches and gravity feed it out into the ponds from there. So you can see the beaver in the lower right. It's a cute little creature. Um, they run havoc on water control uh, structures and ditches. We wanna put water certain areas at a certain depth they have other ideas and are very good at diverting that water and plugging the systems up so it benefits them. It's an ongoing issue. We try to come up with a, a balance between you know, the water that we need and you know, not basically disturbing them too bad. Again, uh, water management, it's a very altered environment. It does not flood naturally. Again, it's a bypass, so it's man-made water diversion around Sacramento. And then it, the water goes in, um, to the tow drain, tides push that up on the tow drain past the Lisbon Weir, and then again we low lift it uh, with, with pumps and then gravity feed it out from there, and it goes through a series of water control structures and man made ditches. Um, again, the system's highly altered, it does not naturally, you know, all the rivers here except for the Kasumnas um, are dammed, and then the water again is completely manipulated um, by us. So, you know, in the end, uh, the managing vegetation equals food and cover. So the ponds that are flooded in the winter, the food that's underneath those that you can't see, which is typically swamp timothy, which is a low growing uh, grass like plant, water grass, which will be emergent or smart weed, is all grown in the spring and early summer. So as we draw down those ponds, um, anywhere from March to April, the moist soil plants, when a certain temperature hits the, the, the ground, will germinate and grow. And that's the food that's flooded up in early fall to provide food for winter and waterfowl. Again, it's a highly manipulated system. You know, pipes, swales move water through the ponds, 
pumping stations, water control structures to the screw gate, um, all combined, you know, to put the water where we want it. It's not a perfect system. It's a shared system with ag and outside entities. Um, it's also, it relies on tides. Sometimes we have low tides and we can't get the water in the quantities that we need it. Uh, the other thing that we have also is we have uh, listed special status species such as snowy plovers, a giant garter snake, tadpole and fairy shrimp. Uh, these all take special management activities that we try to benefit those listed species. And what makes this all the more difficult is we are a bypass and we do flood. It's basically wall to wall water some years. Uh, this makes managing for many of those species very, very difficult. Um, to almost impossible for a portion of the year when you can be inundated for three to four months plus. So one of the things I always tell people about is road maintenance here on YOLO um, is extensive. It happens all year as long as we can, you know, get the equipment out. Um, it's high visitor use and farm equipment. So the heavy farm equipment um, takes its toll on the roads and so does the daily uh, passenger vehicles uh, from both bird watchers and waterfowl hunters. So this is an example. Um, most of the damage that's actually done to the roads isn't when we're completely flooded wall to wall. It's when the water is just starting to go over the roads. That's when it scours. You have wind wave action and damage that does most of the, the road issues. So here's an example of wind waves when it was a little bit flooded, higher than the water is now that eroded a portion of a road. Uh, the heavy farm equipment again, that all takes its toll on the road system, ruts it up, puts holes in it. Um, and we have a, you know, equipment operator. Um, I'm actually have a vacant position right now. So we have a grader that was made in 1978. It was used when we got it um, and it's still the one that's used um, today. Uh, I am not able to operate that equipment, but the people that do, basically that thing does not drive straight. It looks like you've been drinking when you're trying to grade the road because it's pretty old and it will not track well. An example of, you know, flooding from Wall to wall across the bypass. This is I-80 and the rice fields um, just outside of those. So most of the habitat that we have on the wildlife area outside of upland habitat is shallow water habitat. These are heavily used by waterfowl, shorebirds, and wading birds. Uh, the other issue we have on the wildlife area and we have to be cognizant of is mosquitoes, mosquito abatement. Uh, these can be a big problem for human health and safety. We work with our local mosquito vector control agency and they are really good partners to work with. Uh, we coordinate flood up activities, um, pond drawdown, pond flooding. So they can either pre-treat or post-treat depending on what's, um, what's the most efficient way to, to reduce the mosquito alarm or the mosquitoes in the ponds all year round, see if it needs to be treated. We work you know, with best habitat management to minimize the amount of mosquitoes that we produce. Um, and again, the Mosquito and Vector Control District is a really good one to work with this Accio The other thing that people ask me is where does our water come from? Uh, I kind of briefly mentioned it, it's tidally influenced. So the tides push the water up past a water control structure called the Lisbon Weir, and it'll slowly drain back through that. While it's trapped behind that structure, um, we ca capture it with low lift pumps, and then it's gravity fed into um, water conveyance ditches, Sometimes it's have to lift twice, depending on exactly the portion of the wildlife area that it's in. Then it goes out into the ponds from there. We do have a couple deep wells on the area. Probably 95% of our water that we utilize is from surface water. We do use wells occasionally, depending on the year and then in the need. Um, they're much more expensive to run uh, than, than, low, than low lift pumps. Um, and speaking of cost, so my pumping cost, my PG&E bill alone, this is a little bit outdated, is over $250,000 a year um, just for the electricity to pump the water. That's not including the water cost, which is a separate bill um, and the maintenance of the system uh, from a shared system also adds up to that. So it's easily over $350,000 a year in water alone. So this year, as many of you saw, we've had some uh, big habitat projects on the wildlife area and some little habitat projects as well. Um, one of the, the smaller ones in scale compared to the big ones was completed or, or was worked on by the Yolo Resource Conservation District through a Prop 1 grant. This is uh, the Wildlife Corridors for Flood Escape. So what they did is basically plant native vegetation on the existing trellis mounds that are in the southern portion of the wildlife area. Um, so 
wildlife that is trying to escape floodwaters on these trellises, which will stick out of the water, have food and cover for them. And they can also see the next trellis that's further to the west um, and try to get to there to escape the, the floodwaters. So they did these in two main areas. Again, these are all in the southern portion of the wildlife area. Um, what's labeled on this map as the North Corridor is the, the trestles. Um, that's one of the areas that they revegetated. And then the South Corridor, which is our very southern border um, with private property, uh, that's another one that they planted vegetation on. So what you see in parking lot A is a demonstration um, of the plant species that they planted on different areas of the wildlife area as far as their quarter or escape uh, project, escape cover project. So one other thing that's, that went in this year, um, and you can, and I'll have a better map here, but there's two, two ponds or two fields that were previously in rice, told me about 70 acres. If you can see it, it's this field and this field that I took out of rice production and I'm putting it into uh, pollinator habitat, upland habitat. So the California Waterfowl Association did the groundwork this year. So they basically contoured those ponds, put in some islands, put in um, some water, basically swales in a little pondage area. And it's also been seeded this fall with creeping wild rye, blue wild rye, and slender wheatgrass. There will be additional plantings next year, more tailored specifically for pollinators. But we're hoping these areas, um, you know, get heavily utilized by species such as mon uh, monarch butterfly and uh, ground nesting birds. So here's a better map of trying to show you where those fields are. Again, these are highlighted in circles in red. Um, those are the two fields totaling about 70 acres of the um, upland habitat. And here's some schematics, you know, of what those fields will look like. Um, again, the, the yellow area are islands or fill areas, and the blue is water, and so the, the ovals are kind of a deep, little bit deeper water that could act, they act as brood ponds as well. That's one of the fields. This is the smaller field that's towards the east, right adjacent to the tow drain. Uh, very similar um, idea um, as far as the, the construction of it. So the big projects that people saw this year um, were completed by Ducks Unlimited as far with Proposition 1 Adult Conservancy funding. So what you saw was the two new bridges that went in at the Y and the Rice Corner. Uh, these basically took out out old water control structures and pipes. And so those two um, were, were put in. One of the pumping systems, you can see it, we had a pump station, we moved it um, to the east a little bit and put a bigger um, reservoir in so it's easier to manipulate the water. The other portion of this project um, was basically revamping this, runs along I-80 and then head south. It was regraded and deepened um, so it can move water more efficiently. The other portion of this uh, project that was completed this year is the Parker unit. That's the area down here. Um, this was an existing upland. They put in a new pump station so we can basically flood that up um, and add a wetland acres to the wildlife area. So there's a little video, hopefully it works after this. You can see it explains it much better than I can. So hopefully I can get this to, to go. Work this year at the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area included the completion of three major sub-projects. Work at the Y removed undersized culverts with a large precast bridge structure. By removing the small culverts, water is no longer restricted and can flow freely through the system, reducing flooding of the access roads, reducing beaver blockages and maintenance, and allows the wetland habitats to drain in the spring to support wintering waterfowl, shorebirds, and other wetland-dependent species.
Additional improvements at the Y include expanding conveyance capabilities. This includes excavation of existing canals so they are deeper and wider. Canal and water control structure improvements allow greater volume and control for flood up and drawdown of rice fields and managed seasonal wetlands. Excavated material is sidecast and compacted to improve access for operation and maintenance of wetlands and wildlife friendly agriculture. Wetland units of Parker Pond were originally constructed in the late 1990s. However, water elevations in Parker Pond did not get high enough for water managers to flood the newly constructed wetland units. Subproject 5 constructs a new pump station to lift water from Parker Pond to the wetland units for wintering waterfowl, shorebirds, and other wetland dependent species. A forebay and larger afterbay were constructed to support high flood up rates to reduce mosquito production. Project activities at the Rice Corner improves drainage along the South Davis Drain, which in turn improves access throughout the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area by alleviating flooding along the roadway east and south of the Rice Corner. The project replaces culverts and parallel road crossings with a single precast concrete bridge known as a conspan. Thank you to the Delta Conservancy and the Wildlife Conservation Board for funding the project and to all the individuals who helped make this project a reality. We look forward to sharing the project improvements for Greens Lake and the new Cross Canal pump station next year. So I'll see if I can, you know, basically summarize if the sound didn't come through. Um, so the new bridges basically act as water conveyance systems where there was a road crossing with pipes going underneath it in the past. Uh, these basically acted as blockages for water conveyance across the wildlife area and led to it sometimes or contributed to the potential closing of the wildlife area because the frontage road would close or too much water was basically inundated on the road to safely open the wildlife area. So both the, the crossing at the Y and the crossing at the rice corner will help basically um, both water delivery but mostly water drainage to get water moved across the wildlife area. On this side what you're looking at is from the, the Y looking west and basically where all this water comes from is the South Davis drain, which is pumped through the levee from outside entities such as um, the community in South Davis and the, the agriculture uses um, just to the west of the wildlife area. Their, their water gets pumped through us, basically dumped onto the wildlife area and then out um, to the tow drain through, through the wildlife area. But a lot of water is pumped at one time and basically our system is unable to handle that. Um, efficiently. It impacts the, the wetland, it impacts the rice farming, um, and also is potential to, to contribute to closing of the wildlife area because of road footage. So, and what's unique about this region here at the Y is typically all our pump stations low lift water um, out of a ditch or out of the tow drain. Have, I think four hubs that come off of it and flood four different areas or four different units of the wildlife area. Um, so we had an issue getting this pump completely up and running in the time frame that we wanted to, and that's why you saw um, basically some of those ponds in the front not flooded till super late because the PG&E was unable to hook those um, those pumps up because they have all the wildf 
suppliers that they had, they didn't have staff available to do that. Uh, so this is the ditch that was cleaned out. This is, you can see I-80 in the background at the top. Um, this ditch was silted in, not to grade. Um, the water control structures, basically, you can see that one's plugged up by beavers. Uh, some of these water control structures were replaced as well. Um, so that regraded that and, and deepened that ditch so we can get, push more water through it to flood up the wetlands as well. Uh, one of the things that we had to do on this whole, this project was coordinate the activities with the ag user, basically the rice farmer, um, so we didn't impact his ability to irrigate his fields or draw down or basically spill water um, towards the end when he was done basically with the rice. So he needed to put water on this field before that whole ditch was cleaned up. So we ended up putting a cofferdam in, took about um, basically grading the rest of that ditch to the south. And the coffer dam was taken out and the, the remaining ditch was flooded up. So the Parker unit again highlighted here, kind of the middle of the wildlife area. The wildlife area goes a lot further south than this map shows um, on the west hand side. So before there was no reliable way to flood up that unit. And um, so a new water pump station was installed with a basin so we could irrigate and flood up that, that unit, about I think, a little over 200 acres. So here, this is an example of the, the Parker unit. You can see the new pump station and the, the basin uh, that water is pumped into um, after that. And then it's gravity fed out from there into the, the Parker unit fields themselves. We had a slight issue with this one. The water started eroding back along the pipe um, after it initially was installed and we were operating it. So um, we had to stop that. Otherwise it would have took out the levy that it was um, going through. And then the contractor is gonna come back and see if he can fix that. Again, that's the pipe that the water was, was eroding along um, underneath that levee or that road system. Uh, what's also unique is nothing ever surprised me on this wildlife area since I've been here. Um, I met with a contractor, this happened in the summer. I drove down the road, came by about 45 minutes later, and now there's a car in the ditch. Uh, this one was actually kind of concerning because it had a disabled plate and I looked inside and there was a cane, but I could not find anybody. Opened up the door, looked inside, there was nobody in there. I was able to find some uh, people that weren't that far away. And I talked to them and they said that a um, lady had driven into the ditch and she was able to safely get out and call a tow truck, which came later and removed the car. Um, but again, you drive by and an hour later, there's a, there's a car in a ditch. Uh, so the projects that are trying to be implemented for next year by Ducks Unlimited, they're still in the process of securing funding, what we refer to as sub projects two and four. Um, so you'll see, it's hard to see, but this area right here is Greens Lake. And so what part of this project is, is to deepen the capacity of Greens Lake um, and then clean out this ditch that runs north out of Greens Lake towards the I-80. And then those will basically, the spoils from there will be used to improve the road system. Um, same thing, there are the new pumping system going down here to take water flooding off the fields and more efficiently get it out um, of the wildlife area and into the tow drain clean out a ditch and improve a road system there as well. So those are the activities we hope to um, improve as water control structures that will be replaced as part of this as well, this coming up some summer once the funding is secured. Um, again, I mentioned it briefly earlier, you know, a lot of people, and I got a lot of calls on it, um, were concerned about the lack of water um, typically that we'd have in the early fall. Again, the, one of the main reasons for those northern areas was the um, inability to have you know, PG&E hook up that pump system, which is responsible for flooding up those, those northern fields. Combine that with primrose plugging uh, waterways, uh, beavers plugging waterways, and a bunch of, or several pumps uh, that went down this year that needed repair. Again, our water conveyance system is needing uh, updating, and we're in, these projects are hopefully going to fix a lot of um, those infrastructure needs. So that's the, the, the Quick overview of the habitat projects that happened this year and the wildlife area in general. So if anybody has any questions on anything, um, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer those questions. So Joe, we did have one um, coming and it is uh, from Ken Ely and he wanted to know, will the work at the Y give the department more options, flexibility when the South Davis drain um, stormwater is released into the bypass. 
If so, in what way? So it does. It basically increases the capacity of that drainage system, and that's in combination with the, the drain at the rice corner as well. Um, so that right there, when it's come out of there in the past, we, we had two water control structures. We actually had to rip one out before I even got there, before I got to the wildlife area, uh, because we're constantly plugged with beavers and the capacity just wasn't there. So now it's the beavers are not going to be able to plug up, you know, that bridge span where in the past where the pipes are going through there, they could easily plug up and the capacity in general is much greater. So we're, these projects in combination with the other ones are going to help more efficiently get that water through the bypass area and into the tow drain. And the quicker we can do it, the less impact it'll have on the wildlife area. Great, thanks. Um, so another is any consideration of windmills for the low lift pumps with electric backup? No, I have not thought of that one. Um, We've, you know, people have talked about solar potential in the past and different things like that, but I've not heard um, the windmill. And I don't have, you know, any real knowledge of the, the capacity for windmill operated pumps. Um, these pumps are big and, and large and lift a lot of water um, quickly. So I'm not sure how windmills um, would work. And we'll, but, you know, we do have a Delta Breeze. So that, that's something that actually may be worth looking into to supplement um, supplement that on the, on the times we don't need a bunch of water quickly. That's a, that's a good thought. Um, the new area map shows a hiking trail near the east margin of the refuge. Is it within the hunting area? And the map specifies that it is available during the non-hunt season. When will that be available this year? So I'm not sure I'll have to look at the map again. Um, you know, again, we're redoing a lot of this stuff the trails, um, but typically, you know, after hunting season, if it was actually in the hunting season, I maybe at a parking lot F, um, I'll have to get back to you on that, but it'll be after hunting season. So this year, after the general season, we have a youth waterfowl weekend and we have a veterans weekend. So we'll be hunting waterfowl basically till at least mid February. And then um, we'll look at when the rest of the, and then we give it a couple weeks after that. But I'll try to get those open as, as soon as I can. But again, that's one of the things that I'm working on is to get better signage, uh, make sure those trails are maintained and let people know um, the availability and the timing of the availability for those as well. Okay, now I'm gonna show my ignorance on pronunciation here. Um, the question is, I was unaware that there was Lepidur Lepidurus and, boy, Very and, uh, Karen, can you help me? Sure. Frankenecta, fairy shrimp. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't know there were fairy shrimp on the refuge. I, again, I'm not the expert in that. I believe there, there are in the, but I will double check that now. <laughs> there are fairy shrimp uh, and tadpole shrimp, the Brachinecta and Lepidurus at Glide Tool Ranch. Historically, I'm not sure you'd be able to find them every year, but they were there in the 2008 survey. Oh, thank you very much. So I, and I was curious whether those area, whether those vernal pools end up being part of the larger flooded area when the bypass floods. So they're, they're further west and typically don't get inundated in the, the, the floods. Okay. Thanks. Uh, what's the quality of the water that comes into the South Davis drain? It's variable because you're looking at ag runoff and you're looking at you know housing community runoffs like someone sent me a picture uh, I think last week or week before you know of the foam coming through and that's typically to me I think a sign of nitrites or traits um, from uh, fertilizers and stuff like that and just the activity of the, the pump pushing that volume of water frosts it up as well so there's probably you know again typical uh, ag runoff depending on the fertilizers or herbicides that were used and then you know, I think you get actually more from city uh, grasses and things like that, which tend to put more herbicides or pesticides on them. Is the Parker unit adjacent to the Pewter Creek sinks? Yes, it's, it's, it's just north of the Pewter Creek channel that goes through the wildlife area. Where's the best fishing? So typically um, people fish at a parking lot F uh, in the tow drain itself. What's funny is my first year there, you know, I would see people fishing, but I would never see anybody catch anything. It always made me laugh too, is 
like I'd stop in the work truck and then people would stop fishing, put their stuff away and leave. And I just don't know if they didn't have a fishing license um, or it was just really bad timing for multiple aspects on, on my part. Um, but this last couple of years, I've seen, you know, people fishing it by the check station and parking lot, you know, app. Again, like most of the things I saw caught were carp. Are salmon raised in the basin? So, um, and again, I'm not a fisheries expert, you know, and I know we've been working on the, the Puda Creek um, salmon issues. Um, so I don't know if they're raised in the basin. I know there's fish that come from the hatchery that come up you know, and go through the check dam and into Puda Creek. And that's why, you know, we try to pull those boards as soon as our operational needs are, are met and the outside ag operations are met as well. Um, so we do have salmon that go through the wildlife area. Uh, some of those have been tagged and monitored, um, I think by UC Davis and our fisheries people. Can the improvements to Greens Lake bring in other bird species and will it be deeper? So I'm not sure if it'll bring in other bird species. It definitely will be deeper um, to, to increase the capacity. That lake is also used, you know, as part of the water um, conveyance system. So it's basically acts as a storage. We can pump water into it and then feed it out into either the wetlands or the rice fields. And same thing when depending on the exact fields, draining it as well, uh, water is run through there. So it'll make um, water conveyance easier and more efficient but I don't know if it'll actually bring in um, additional um, species that are gonna use the deeper water. Right now, there's not a lot um, that use that. So maybe making it deeper will, will enhance that. Is the water lower near parking lot C this year because of the pg e pump issue or are there other reasons? So it's, it's part of it. So we also had issues um, with our outside water, basically, uh, what's the right terminology? or supplier, uh, they had some of their systems go down. And so their ditches dropped, uh, their water conveyance ditches dropped, which we pump off of. So we lost um, several weeks uh, being able to pump water from the Los Rios system, which we typically would. And then we had to also put in a, a coffer dam. So the road that goes, you know, uh, the one-way road between basically B and C, uh, we had a coffer dam that up. So we couldn't start the water as early as we wanted that water, the pipe that goes through this, that road leaks. Um, so we had to get that done. Again, being short staff, it took a little bit longer than we wanted. And so it was a combination of that and those north ponds on there are actually fed from the new pump station that was moved. Um, but it was a combination of us losing access to water, um, the leaking pipe and the new pump system. We have a comment that it would be good if um, issues like the delayed flooding it could be available online, um, either on the Yolo Basin or Fish and Wildlife websites. No, and that's a very good comment. And it's one thing that, you know, it's on my list of trying to get information in a more timely fashion. Um, again, either through our website or the, the foundation, so people are aware. We do try to put things on our Facebook page, too, when we, um, when we realize. So that's another good place to kind of take a peek. Um, are the vernal pools accessible to the public? Are there trails to them? There are not. And at this point, they're, they're not accessible outside of special uh, use days and tours and things like that. So that's something that we're actually uh, talking to the foundation of trying to come up with more days that they can be accessed. Uh, Um, by the general public, it's actually you know it's making sure that livestock don't get out as well. But yeah, I'm all for trying to get you know more public access um, within the limits of our manage management activities. And what type of wildlife are using the special corridor? Um, so, are you, if you're talking about the the RCDs habitat project, so there'll be you know, things like you know they've seen deer, rabbits raccoons, you know, mesocarnivores, you know, small mammals um, that typically, you know, obviously can't fly away from the floodwaters. And so they've driven up to them in boats and over the years of previous management, you know, you come to one of the trestles, you know, and there'd be a deer, um, rabbits, you know, coyote. Um, and then after a week, there's no more rabbits, just the coyote and the deer, um, that type of stuff. So it, it, it gets trapped small mammals, even up, you know, the deer size. Um, where's the wisdom Lear, Weir, sorry, um, and does the water move east to west or west to east? 
So water, um, Lisbon Weir is about, I'm trying to remember it's not made, about three quarters of the way down on the tow drain. Um, and the water's moving north and south. So it gets pushed up from the delta from the south, past the weir, and then further up into the tow drain. And then we have a series of low lift pumps, you know, north to south along that tow drain that pull water out of there. And so, um, again, depending on the tides, you know, higher tides push more water. Um, the deeper the water is in the tow drain, the more head pressure you have with low lift pumps means the more water you can take. If the tides are low and not you know, very strong, and that water drops, um, sometimes it, you almost go dry. We obviously can't bump when it's dry. And even when the water is lower, you don't get as good head pressure, uh, so you can't take as much water out of the system. How many times has the bypass been flooded? Can you talk about the process and how does the land recover? So, I mean, I think what they told me in general, once every five years, it'll go wall to wall. Um, so we had it not this last year, but the year before, and then two years before that, right before I got there um, at the wildlife area. So it's basically um, water comes over the, the Fremont Weir, starts going into the bypass. When things are really bad, they'll open up the Sacramento Weir, which is just not that far north of us, putting more water into the bypass. It, it comes across to us. Um, what typically what happens is we get lower flood events where we're not flooded wall to wall, but we start having uncontrolled water come onto the wildlife area. You know, one of the, what's, what's amazing is one of the lowest areas on the wildlife area is just past the entrance road that'll flood um, either from Willow Slough or water backing up in combination, you know, for the Davis drain, um, it stacks up, can't get past the old water control structures, backs up, goes over the road. Um, so, and then it slowly basically, you know, works its way from east to west. It's not exactly true, but in general, it is. There's some high ridges in between there um, and floods out, but it'll flood out parking lot F, flood out the interest road, and then various other aspects, you know, the northeast corner will also flood um, quickly as well. So the, the flooding, you know, will probably be increased as part of the Fremont Weir project. That's the goal of that project is to put more water through the bypass, exactly how that affects um, the wildlife area. We're not 100% sure. It is going to lead to more inundation days, um, potentially more closures. That's why we're hoping, you know, all these infrastructure projects um, can reduce, you know, any additional closures and basically leave us open for more periods of time. Um, but, we, you know, it is a bypass. It does take water around Sacramento, and it's always going to be um, an issue to continue with. But basically, you know, so the management activities, so when you flood, especially on a, uh, an upland field, you could have a completely different species composition of plants from one year to the next, having done absolutely nothing but how long the water was on there and when the water came off, the timing basically the soil temperature. So, you know, some years I'll have complete, you know, pockler sunflower, and then the next year it didn't flood, I'll have, you know, uh, ryegrass, intermediate wheatgrass, um, things, you know, Again, I've done nothing on the ground to change that, but the plant community completely changed on its own just because of the, the, the water regime. Um, so that's always interesting. What typically happens is also, you know, being flooded wall to wall, um, you'll see a, a, a heavy reduction in rodent populations and mesocarnivores because um, there's nothing for them to eat. If they didn't escape, they drown in the floodwaters. And so the following year, you have ground nesting birds um, will have lower predation rates. And you'll see like an increase in pheasant population. Um, this is slowly followed the year before by increase, you know, in, in skunks, raccoons, um, you know, small mammals, mice, things like voles like that are much quicker to repopulate. Um, so you have this dynamic of, you know, wiping, you know, a good amount of stuff out and then having it recover um, fairly quickly with new habitat. Um, it does reduce the, um, the grasses, if the the water sits too long. Um, past April, there actually is a clause in the grazing lease that they'll see a rent reduction because that ground is inundated and not available to them. Um, a lot of times, you know, if that water sits and it comes off, there's nothing growing there for, for quite a while. Um, so that rent reduction for them, you know, is great for them. Uh, that's income to the wildlife area that I don't have and I'm already already limited. So there's a, there's a drawback on that aspect. Hopefully that answered the, um, the question. I think so. Um, how much does the mercury sludge from the gold rush still impact the area? You know, I'm not sure. I don't really have a good grasp on the 
methyl mercury uh, issue on the wildlife area. You know, I know that activities that they've done in the past in trying to take water from, you know, um, wetland units or, or semi-permanent wetland units into permanent wetlands and letting it sit has reduced the amount of methyl or mercury before it goes out into the tow drain. Uh, but those management activities, again, stuff that we continue to do today, but I don't really have a good idea, you know, exactly the impacts um, from the mercury. Um, is there a place where the beavers are allowed to build a dam? They pretty much are allowed anywhere. Um, we rarely ever try to basically um, lethally remove the beavers uh, in case it's just flat out, you know, they're really impacting something super heavily. We will um, go in with maybe one of our ag leases and a depredation permit and remove some beavers. But typically we just try to come up with a level that they like, um, but they're free to build it wherever they want and they do build it um, wherever they wherever they want. So and if I could get my people to work as hard as a beaver family overnight, that would be outstanding. We will go in with a backhoe and remove their construction you know, activities. And literally, you know, eight hours later, they built it bigger and better. Um, and they don't even have thumbs. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's a pretty impressive species. You know, it's a love-hate relationship because they really make the water um, situation difficult, um, but they're just a, a, a fascinating creature. Hmm. Can the general public access the Pewter Creek sinks on their own? So right now, you know, on the north side, you know, through that hiking trail that's been that me and um, Chelsea worked on, they can during portions of the year, but past that, that's part of the grazing area, so that's still going to be um, closed off. What is the status of the giant garter snakes on the refuge? I believe they had been identified there some time ago. So they're still there, um, you know, and that's part of the construction activities that we had. We had to do biological monitoring to make sure that no giant garter snakes were in the way of the heavy equipment. So while the you know construction crews are going, we have a monitor on site each day um, to check, make sure they'll walk the area before uh, construction equipment gets there. They'll go out in front of the construction equipment. You know, again, make sure and monitor during the day that that no snakes are there. We did find uh, a couple. They were basically left on their own. That's, that's the protocol. Is once a snake is found, that all construction activities stop. The snake is not harassed or picked up or moved. They just need to leave on their own. But there are a couple times that we saw snakes. Um, they're definitely there. We see them, you know, throughout the year. Um, there's more outside. Um, we have a little piece on the outside of the bypass that isn't inundated, you know, because it's on the outside of the levee. And so I guess in the past, when they've done surveys, that area had a much higher density of snakes than the surveys they did inside the bypass. And it makes sense, you know, if it's, I don't know, again, not a snake expert either, um, if they're in their burrows and it's inundated for four months with water, you know, if they can survive that, you know, if, it, if, if it's just not enough, you know, oxygen or the water gets in the burrows, that type of stuff. So there's typically more you know, yeah. outside than on the inside. But yeah, we see them you know, on a fairly regular basis throughout the wildlife area. Is there any saltwater intrusion into the area of the pumps? Not that I'm aware of. So that has not been an issue that's been brought to my attention. So as far as I know, it's completely fresh water. Are you actively removing primrose? Uh, on a daily basis during the summer, um, we will fully remove it. We will spray uh, herbicides to remove it. Uh, one of the new species that looks similar to primrose is alligator weed, which is also another, you know, heavily invasive species. We're on the lookout for that. We have not found it on the wildlife area yet, but um, it's it, it's probably coming because it's north and south of us. Um, so primrose, uh, again, just a heavily intrusive uh, species. What it does, you know, besides, you know, itself physically blocks the waterways, it grows super quick. It also traps sediment and our water is you know fairly dirty water so there's a heavy sediment load and so when that water stops by hitting the primrose all that sediment drops out and it's in our water conveyance ditches and so that's why you'll see these ditches filling quicker um i could have somebody full time and still not get ahead of the primrose you know spraying or physically removing it um like with an excavator or a backfill bucket specifically designed to remove vegetation you know from the waterways so no crossing the bridge at parking lot G? Not, no. So it's, it's open um, during waterfowl season to waterfowl hunting because our, our ag leases are out of there. 
uh, but during the remainder of the year, that's uh, it's actively grazed. Um, so it's still close to the general public. Okay. Anybody else? I think that was my the last question I see on my chat list here. So the other thing, if anybody has questions, you think something, you hang up, um, you know, feel free to call the, the front office. Um, right now, there's no person there, but you can leave a message. Those messages get to me. Again, we have just because of COVID, we are um, trying to keep, keep everybody out of the office as much as possible. What was the last, uh, wait a minute, what was the tour loop at the north end of the sinks? Hmm. I'm not, I got to make sure I'm understanding exactly what you mean by, by this, this sink. So, the hiking trail. Oh, so basically on the north side of Puda Creek, you know, just to the west of parking lot G, there's a series of basically north-south crosses and then east-west um, hiking trail that's all incorporated. Um, again, we're trying to keep those mowed. Um, some of those road systems near Puda Creek it's not safe to put a, a full-size tractor on. Um, and I found that out driving my uh, work truck on it this year as well. Um, so again, trying to maintain those as much as possible and get better signage so people can, can see where those trails actually exist. Okay, a couple more coming in here. Um, is there any information about Nutria in the bypass? So, so far, no Nutria have been found in the bypass. Um, what it's always interesting and fully expected is as soon as you still people, uh, typically those beavers or muskrats so far. Um, we've had a couple reports that people up in Sunday Nutria, we put out trail cameras, et cetera, in those areas. Um, and all we got was pictures of beavers or Nutria. So far, they're still um, only to the south of us um, around Stockton, but most of them are in the Los Banos Merced County um, area. But, you know, they are still actively trapping those and removing them, but we have not had any on us yet. Okay. What I also find interesting with Nutria, you know, is they, they, they eat cattails, you know, and, and destroy those and um, vegetation. And I pay people to mow cattails for a majority of the year um, to keep open water habitat. Um, besides the burrowing and the levees, if I could pay Nutria to, to replace some of my, my staff, it'd be much cheaper for me. <laughs> Um, do you think the pesticides and insecticides will impact the monarchs and the other pollinators? So we uh, ourselves don't use insecticides. Uh, we just use herbicides on, you know, like primrose or trying to kill star thistle and stuff like that. So uh, I don't think they, they will. But again, you know, we won't spray those direct areas, you know, with those chemicals, just the waterways around them. Does the um, uh, rice farmers use them? So the rice farmer, um, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head. I mean, they do, um, they because they, they maintain the waterways during the rice growing operation. They usually use physical uh, removal of the primrose, but they will spray as well. Um, and I don't recall off the top of my head, you know, what um, insecticide they're using, if any. Um, uh, used to be, just a, an aside, um, at least when Jack was there, um, he used to tell me he didn't use insecticide, he did use herbicide. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said he never had problems with insects because of the bats. <laughs> so anyway, that's an aside. Um, on the map, um, those trails are not labeled as hiking trails. So that's, it's part of the new map and that's not listed, you know, here. And so that's one of the things I'm working on, you know, with Chelsea from the foundation. You come up with a new map and we put those ones on Puda Creek. So that's not up and, uh, and, up and running yet. Does, um, aside from the foundation, does CDFW use volunteers? So we do, but not to the same degree that the foundation does. Because for when we use volunteers, it's going to be a direct specific reason. Um, a lot, of, I get, you know, on a regular basis, people that want to volunteer. Um, but depending on the work that's needed, um, sometimes volunteers are more work for me than the work that they actually get done. Um, you know, so I get to make sure when I give somebody something that is something they can do, the stuff that we do is not done by because of the scale that we're involved with. 
We do have a basically blind clean out garbage pickup day is typically done in August, September each year. Obviously we didn't do this year with COVID. Um, there are times when people have volunteered at the check station, but it's, I gotta have something specific that works with volunteers um, at, at a scale that's gonna be useful. I see people walking on the roads of the auto tour route. Is that permissible? Yes, we're different than the feds. Um, all our wildlife areas are, um, the rules and regulations are in Title 14 of the Natural Resources Code. So they can walk you know, on the road system on state wildlife areas where the federal system has different rules and regulations and they require you to maintain in your vehicle. Um, you know, obviously this always creates a, a conflict with people that want to burn from their vehicles, which are less disturbance to wildlife um, than people walking, um, but it's not illegal, so I don't know. Okay, and um, what about vector control? Um, don't they use pesticides? So they will use, usually um, mosquito abatement does larvicide or adult side, so they do use insecticides. Um, their preferred alternative or preferred method is larvicide to pre-treat a field before it's flooded. It's more effective. Um, if we're gonna hold water for a long period of time, they'll put mosquito fish out. Uh, so they try to re you know, reduce their overall use of adulticide, but they definitely will um, utilize it. All right, well, thank you so much, Joe, for all the great info. Uh, and uh, as Joe said, you know, if people continue to have questions, you're welcome to ask. I will um, work on, on getting this revised over to um, a version that I can put over onto YouTube for us. And um, also I wanna remind people um, that next month on uh, February 4th, we're gonna have Restoring Common MERS um, to Devil Slide Rock uh, with Michael Parker, who was one of the people who worked on that effort. Um, he'll be talking about some really fascinating um, work that was done to help those birds return. Um, and just so you know, Joe, you're having several people write in um, thanking you um, for your time, your dedication, your presentation. Yep. Thank you, guys. And, uh, you know, special, you know, Corky to the foundation. Um, I appreciate all the work they did and the volunteers that you guys had, especially with the school groups, although this year is obviously much greatly reduced. Um, the amount of effort and time that the volunteers and the foundation put in, you know, there's no way the department, you know, could do that to have that many school groups come through. Um, the staffing level and, you know, basically funding would not be there. So that's greatly appreciated. All right. We will see you either virtually or at some point in real life here in the future. Thanks, Thanks so much. You. All right. Have a great evening. See ya. Bye-bye.